All right, welcome to another episode of the Aspiring VC. I am here with my friend and former colleague, Ollie Howie at the SoftBank Opportunity Fund. Uh, but before we get into anything too serious, Ollie, uh, we would like to know Dunkin' or Starbucks and why? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it's on you, then Starbucks for sure. <laughs> you know I'm a loyal Dunkin' guy. Um, yeah. Okay, let's do a two-minute summary about you know yourself and the firm and the role. Yeah, yeah. So as you said, we're former colleagues out of school at Greenspring. I uh, kind of learned the ropes of VC coming out. Uh, learned a lot from the GPs there. And kind of the last seven months been at the Opportunity Fund. It's a $100 million fund for minority entrepreneurs, Black, Latinx, Native American. Um, and really looking to add more than capital to the ecosystem and change our communities for the better. Uh, so it's been a pleasure and a privilege to be able to invest in some amazing startups from folks changing the nonprofit space to the cybersecurity space to healthcare and fintech. So it's been a lot of fun working on the early stage team there, uh, led by Paul Judge, and uh, learning a lot. Yeah, man, it's a pretty amazing fund and uh, just an awesome, I think, learning experience as well. Um, can yeah. we dive in a, a little bit more on like the distinction between like SoftBank and then the specific SoftBank Opportunity Fund. Um, yeah. How you guys operate? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it was formed in the wake of George Floyd and so many events that happened in 2020 and throughout kind of American history. Um, but just uh, an avenue for folks to not be discriminated against when looking for capital and venture capital. And we know at the early stage, it's a lot of you know, who you know. And we wanted to make sure that folks that are underrepresented also had a fund. Um, and we think that we can make great returns. Uh, all these comments are my own, but uh, I'm personally very bullish on kind of entrepreneurs that look like me and, and that are maybe underrepresented, that they can come up with great ideas and be able to implement that at scale as good as, if not better than anyone else. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's an amazing, uh, amazing vehicle and really filling like a super important um, niche and kind of gap in the market. Um, you know, I think it'd be great to learn. Uh, this is kind of the crux of the podcast about your origin story, right? So how did you get first, how did you get to Greenspring? And then second, how did you get to Softening Opportunity Fund and just kind of the pivotal life experiences at each level of the way, um, you know, all, kind of like all the way from high school up? Yeah, yeah. No, in high school, uh Watched a lot of Shark Tank. That's probably cliche nowadays. But uh, in high school, just loved uh, learning more about ingenuity. Didn't really know what venture capital was. I went into school and wanted to go into business. I didn't really know what that was either or what that meant. But uh, I just kind of liked finance and wanted to figure out how to you know, create markets and um, how all these amazing companies kind of come to be. Uh, studied economics in school, and my first internship was at Goldman Sachs in wealth management. Um, and there, we just learned about the asset classes, their role in the portfolio. That was really my first time really grasping what venture was. I went back to Harvard and uh, did a few other internships and um, played with a few ideas as well, but ultimately kind of really got an itch for venture capital um, after trying to be a startup uh, CEO myself just seeing how hard it is and um, how resilient you have to be as a founder and also uh, the experience that you kind of need to be able to be successful. And so coming out of school, I got the opportunity to um, pitch to VCs a few of my ideas in the past. And so it made sense that uh, I wanted to be a part of a cohort of folks that also, we're into venture and the startups. So I joined Venture for America out of school. And through that avenue, um, got connected with Greenspring and um, really just love the model uh, there. Just being able to learn so much about so many different startups in the ecosystem, everybody from um, Benchmark to Excel to Andreessen, as you know, uh, are folks that Greenspring invests in and subsequently tertiarily their uh, portfolio companies. So it was a great place to just learn, you know, what are these startups, you know, what ideas are already out there that, you know, nobody outside of the folks in the industry know about. So uh, it was a great opportunity and um, 
that was kind of how I got into venture, learned a ton there. And then the opportunity fund, like I said, it, it was something that kind of came to be in 2020. It was, you know, the second year of uh, me working at Green Spring and um, it just, you know, it made so much sense to be able to not only provide returns and do early stage investing, which uh, is something that I'm passionate about, but also give back to my community and figure out ways that um, we can catalyze change and growth in an area that needed a lot of growth and change. And we see, you know, the statistics that 2% or 1% or less than 1% of folks that are minority get uh, VC funding. And so hopefully this makes a small dent in that small impact. And that's why I wanted to ultimately go to the opportunity fund. Absolutely, man. And, you know, two, two things I would like to kind of dive a little more into is one, you're my first guest to come from uh, Venture for America. Uh, shout out to Ben Boyd and Hayden Cohen as well, who are <laughs> cohort. Uh, shout we, out to um, so I'd love to dive into that. And then also the Goldman um, program, it seems like both of those were pretty pivotal, uh, pr sorry, pretty key pivotal moments that, you know, opened these doors next. So what was it that got you into both of those programs? Yeah, yeah, no. Good question. I think um, Goldman, I was development chair of Harvard uh, Black Men's Forum. And one of the uh, duties that I had was kind of liaisoning with uh, folks that would come to campus. And Goldman Sachs um, was definitely on campus and they had a great presence there. Uh, I remember folks coming in with very nice suits and um, able to speak very articulately about the markets way more um, articulate than I had ever, you know, seen before. And so I really wanted to be a part of that and figure out how to, uh, learn more about what they were doing. At the time I was, you know, 19, I probably knew just a little bit about investment banking as a whole, but, um, I knew that they were one of the major players. And so after kind of asking them for money for the club, um, I got, an opportunity to interview with a wealth management team. And that's kind of how it came to be. Um, met some amazing folks there, actually uh, in New York and in Atlanta where I'm back. Um, so it, it was a great experience. Um, Carl Peoples, Nicole Ross, uh, some great folks that um, were able to give opportunity to me at a, at a young age. So it was a good opportunity. And then for Venture for America, uh, like I said, I'd kind of been around um, VCs a little bit, just pitching startups and um, in the startup community. And that's one that I heard of uh, from a friend um, that kind of also was an entrepreneur in college. Um, and Baltimore was one of the cities that was on their radar. Um, and I have family from Baltimore. I call that one of my homes. Uh, so. It was something that was on my radar and that's another mission that I was uh, aligned with, just being able to provide economic opportunity to uh, cities that may not necessarily have the same representation that a Silicon Valley or New York uh, would have. And so um, it made a lot of sense there too, to be able to be a part of the Baltimore community, give back to that community, uh, one that I grew up in, and then also be able to invest at a global scale at Green Spring. So um, kind of you know, went through that process and Green Spring was the, the one uh, firm that I applied to and, and wanted to be a part of. So it worked out from that perspective. Um, and uh, yeah, I think great cohort of folks from both experiences and opportunities and blessed to have uh, both of those. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I just realized, I don't know why I didn't bring this up, but we talk about like how you got into Harvard, right? I think there's a lot of people that go after that. And I don't think people, a lot of us even understand, like I certainly don't even understand what the process was like when you were going through recruitment for that. Uh, so it'd be kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. No, another blessing. Um, I, I don't really know their whole process. I applied early. Um, I was valedictorian in my school, I'm in high school in Roanoke, Virginia. Um, but I really just uh, 
um, you know, shot my shot. I think that, uh, you know, Harvard is an amazing place to uh, go. And I think they do have a, a high bar, but I would say a lot of folks that went to other schools learned some of the same things that I learned, but really it's like the people that get to meet um, and be in classes with. And that's another one. I don't really know why they picked me, but uh, I'm glad that it happened. Uh, it seems like a while ago, but it wasn't that long ago. And um, I think regardless of if you go to Ivy League school or not, um, there's so many resources out there today, especially with uh, a computer. Uh, you can go on YouTube and watch CS50, one of the computer science classes for Harvard, for instance, that every freshman takes and you can just watch it online. So I think it's great that everything's more democratized now and you don't necessarily have to get in to be in a Harvard class. Um, so that's something that I would definitely urge viewers or folks that are interested to, to do, especially if you're in high school already, that's a great way to get a leg up. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the, you know, uh, key pieces of the podcast as well is kind of the practical tips and advice for the listeners. Again, you know, a lot of, yeah. the, you know, high school or early young professionals trying to break into the industry. Like what are the like things that you did? What was your strategy on networking? What, what kept you with the grit and the motivation going after opportunities and succeeding once you got them? Um, you know, what are those things that you provide to some of the listeners? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you only need one. Yes. Shu, one of the managing partners at SoftBank, uh, said that and makes a lot of sense. Um, you just got to keep being resilient. And uh, at a young age, I mean, it's it's tough to be an investor and to be kind of qualified to do so um, because a lot of great investors are former entrepreneurs or um, have some sort of tie. And so I think that you know, at a young age, you should try to do those things, even if it's not, if you're not going to spend your whole life doing it. Um, especially in 2021, I remember in school, we made a few websites um, and app designs and uh, different business models just to see what would be uh, appealing, created content um, just to see if people would like it. And so I urge folks that are interested in BC to be interested in entrepreneurship and to know what it is to be an entrepreneur and how hard it is to find product market fit and uh, to get people to like what you're building. Uh, I think it gives you an appreciation, if nothing else, of kind of the folks that you're investing in and how difficult it is to do what they're doing. Um, but outside of that, I would urge folks to uh, you know be very targeted with now networking, as you were saying, and then also know uh, something about the firm that you're talking to. And so almost every VC firm, except probably Benchmark, has a, a website with their portfolio. Uh, you can go through and, and see which ones you like. Um, and so I found that to be helpful on both ends, both trying to break into venture and then people that came to me and wanted to break in when they did research on like a portfolio company, or when I did research on a portfolio company, it gave uh, a starting point um, to that conversation. So I would urge folks to follow uh, stuff in the news, TechCrunch, uh, 20 Minute BC, or kind of whatever news outlet you like uh, to follow the news and then um, to be strategic about LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, connections. And then once you get those connections, just know something about the uh, investments that that VC does. Um, she or he has spent a lot of time uh, betting those startups and then post investment, they're probably a board observer or on the board. And so they know a lot about it and they probably want to talk about it. And so if you can bring good points, um, even some that you like and some that you maybe don't like as much, I think that's a constructive way to have a conversation. Totally. And I think having someone that's done their homework, even if it's just on knowing your background when they reach out to you, uh, just makes a huge difference. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, 
all these people have so much demands on their time that if you can just show that you've done a little bit of homework first, it really will make you stand out. Um, yeah, agreed. One thing would be cool to dive into is, you know, I feel like we have a sense for why you liked venture. And I guess part of it was that, you know, you did, you were a builder, you were an entrepreneur yourself, and you got to talk to VCs from that table. I guess, you know, what are some of the other aspects that drew you and maybe keep you in the industry? And then, you know, what is it about, I guess you're more on the kind of series A and earlier stage side. And, and so what about that? And then, about, you know, supporting the diverse founders as well. Yeah, yeah, great questions. I think that, um, you know, being a venture capitalist, a generalist, um, looking at different sectors is something that really interests me. In school, in very early school, you kind of have different subjects, um, you know, math, science, and you, got, you have to learn about all of those. I really enjoyed that type of experience. As you get older in academia, it tends to make you concentrate or focus. But in BC, um, you can really have that same kind of childlike mentality where you're learning about education and then learning about a science-based uh, company and then learning about um, healthcare and then learning about FinTech. And so you kind of have to know a little bit about all of that stuff and you get a lot of stimulation, I think, in doing so. And so it's always an exciting day. It's never boring. You wake up to a calendar full of folks that uh, are smarter than you and know a lot more about their startup than you do. And you get to ask them whatever questions and um, get to know them. And it's a lot of fun from that standpoint. Um, early stage, it's even more so that it's even more volume, it's more people to look at. Uh, it's uh, more about the founder, it's more about the team and what they can turn the ultimate product or idea at that stage into. A lot of folks you know, have a product and then wanna make it a business or have a, um, some users and wanna learn how to monetize. Um, so it's really, uh, less stringent than the growth stage because you don't know what the company is going to be in five years. You just kind of know, hey, this is a great founder. It's a great market. They have um, traction in this initial product. I believe in them and I think I can help them um, turn this into a real uh, billion dollar business. And so that's really exciting. Uh, just being a part of that journey and getting to know the founders. It's the longest uh, journey uh, from there to exit when you're an early stage investor. So you feel like a, almost like a team member or co-founder. And um, it, it's really just rewarding when it, when it does work out. It's very risky, um, but it's a lot of fun. And so uh, enjoying my job, definitely. Opportunity fund, it's even more so because then it's, uh, I get to help this other founder of color break down barriers for the next founder. And, um, you know, that ripple effect is uh, something that hopefully lasts for a long time. Yeah, we talked about um, in a prior podcast episode, talked about with one of the guests about how, you know, a successful tech ecosystem, whether it's in a certain state or even just a certain city, uh, starts to have these ripple effects, right? And so especially if that ecosystem is focusing on diversity, uh, you have one founder has an exit and well, now that founder's got some money and maybe they start angel investing, right? And then they start yep. other businesses and so you have all these uh, future ripple effects that are made. Um, and it's kind of like this rising tide that lifts all boats. Exactly, exactly. That's, that's the goal. I mean, that's the difference to me between venture capital and like equity investing. Um, you're along for the ride and if you buy... Apple stock, nobody at Apple, unless you're buying very big chunks, will know who you are. Um, but these early stage founders, you're with them in the trenches and going to the board meetings and really helping them, hopefully, uh, add value and kind of change their market for the better. So another cool line I heard once was that this is the only area in finance where the security selects the investor and every other part of finance. <laughs> the security but you can't just you can find yeah, the greatest startup and if they don't want you in the round you're not that's true so uh, that's a pretty unique element to it um i think this transitions well into the next question which is 
what is the impact that you really want to see in the world and kind of twofold, like, what do you want to see founders going out tackling? And then what do you want to be kind of your direct life impact? Yeah. Yeah. You're coming with the deep questions here. Matt. <laughs> yeah, I know. I like these. Uh, yeah. I mean, I just want to leave the world a better place than, you know, when I came and, um, you know, hopefully invest in a lot of folks that are smarter than me and that can do things that I can only dream about and I can believe in the dream and invest in it. Um, I think that, you know, I just want more opportunities for everyone, like an equal chance at opportunity and that, um, you know, folks are ultimately given the same kind of starting point as well as the same metrics and hurdles to hit. I think a lot of times VCs have these certain hurdles and metrics, but everybody's starting at a different position. And so hopefully I help a little bit in moving everyone to kind of equality from the onset. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really about, you know, what you do for others that is lasting, you know, just being one person. Um, so just giving back to others and hopefully giving some small tidbits of wisdom or a small check to someone that is able to do way bigger things um, than I could with it. So um, I need to think through that a little bit more. It was a deep question, but uh, that's yeah, I think that was my great. initial reaction. Yeah, no, I really like that. Um, well, if you're ready, man, we can go into some rapid fire questions here. Okay, I'm ready. First one. So these are like short answers, right? Yeah, yeah, short. They okay. could be, you know, it could be a few minutes though. So who has been one of your most important mentors? And if possible, do you have a quote or like a specific action or piece of wisdom they gave you that still stays in mind today? Ah, uh, good question. Um, I'd be remiss if we, we didn't talk about, you know, Ashton on the call, our former uh, leader at Greenspring. Um, I think he taught us a lot about trusted relationships and just how to you know, gain a network of folks that uh, can be champions for you. And, you know, that may, again, you know, have more expertise in certain spaces. So you're able to kind of lean on them and understand more by, you know, working with others and creating a better result as a, as a um, byproduct. So I would definitely name him as a big influence. He taught uh, me a lot about venture. I'm sure you too, um, just about how to think about it. And, um, you know, just seeing him on the day to day, how he works and being able to also, you know, talk to and empathize with um, entrepreneurs as well as fund managers is a great quality and something that um, I hope to take. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is really amazing what he's built at, at Greenspring. Uh, it's truly unbelievable. The impact of the platform and being on the cutting edge with impact funds and diversity. Um, exactly. Exactly. And he's also taught me a lot about, you know, the jobs that ultimately get created as a byproduct and not just thinking in a silo. I think it's easy for a VC to just be like, oh, it's, you know, this idea, that idea, but like what impact is that going to have on the labor market, the broader economy? Um, it's, are all great things that I learned from them. Absolutely. Um, who is one of your favorite VCs, you know, outside of the firm you're at right now? Yeah, one of the, one of my favorite VCs, I would say is Barry Eggers. First, he was able to kind of, you know, do B2B SaaS, which sounds like, uh, you know, something that is from an investor perspective, kind of, um, our sweet spot, right? Because you, you get to have like the contracted revenue and you can look at churn and things like that. So it's great from that perspective. He was very successful, but then he was also able to invest in Snapchat and other consumer companies. And so just that versatility is something that makes me admire him and being able to kind of listen to um, the masses, even if you don't necessarily uh, identify or you're not the end user of a product, you're still able to understand kind of the mass appeal at a early stage. Uh, I think that's very difficult to do. And one reason why I look up to. Absolutely. Um, 
when you look at startups, what are some of the characteristics about a good startup that you know, get you really excited? Yeah, yeah. Like I was saying, I mean, I, it really starts with the founder and their vision for the company and the founding team. And so that always gets me really excited. Uh, it always comes back down to people. And so that's the number one thing in the early stage investor. Um, at least I look at, it. I can't speak for everyone, but um, I think, you know, finding product market fit and having the right market and all of that is very good. And are also things that I look at and traction and revenue growth um, are all very important. I look at those as well. I think it's no one silver bullet where it's like this one thing will definitely uh, make a great startup, but it's often a combination of just resilient, humble founders that are really good at whatever they do and that are uniquely positioned um, to do so. And then you know, having the right products, being able to expand upon that product and not be stagnant in the, in the marketplace, but something that's always growing and you're always getting feedback and making it better. And then uh, obviously the market size determines how big it can be. So that also has to be there. Um, I think it's elements of all of that. And it's ultimately how much people like what you're building and people are desperate for your good and what you're making. I think you'll have some success. And if you're a great founder and you have the vision to capitalize upon those initial users and make sure that they stay and sticky, that's something that we would, we love to invest in. Um, the last one here, what are some of your favorite like podcasts, books, blogs, um, both on the venture side and on kind of the promoting like diversity and equality side? Yeah, I mean, your blog, uh, 20 Minute VC, that's a good one. Um, I think AZ16 has a good one. Um, um, venture Deals is a good one, as you know, for folks that are coming into the industry. That's one that's highly recommended. Um, I think, you know, it's just so many resources nowadays more than ever before to just go on the internet and find new things. So I would encourage folks to, you know, read those traditional books, but to also look at you know, live case studies and things that are in practice. Um, and, a lot of blogs uh, come out subsequent to an investment. And so furthering that theme of you know, following a GP or a venture funds portfolio, if you can kind of follow up on their announcement and their blog posts and um, different you know, uh, publications subsequent to the investment, I think those are all really good things because a lot of times venture capitalists have great insights after they make an investment. And so the blog posts after like a great investment uh, is also something to watch for and, and look at. Totally. Yeah. I think the savvy listeners, if they start knowing all the names of the venture firms and really obsessing over the websites and the blogs, you know, they will start to know a lot about who's doing what and what's going on with these companies. Yep. Um, yep. Okay. This is a fun outro that we took from Tim Ferriss. Uh, love this question though. What is a purchase of like a hundred bucks or a few hundred? has had an outsized impact of joy Ooh, 100 bucks or a few hundred that's had an outsized impact uh it's a good question um i would say like i don't know if it was a few hundred bucks but whatever my first computer was just being able to be plugged into everything uh, from a click of a button is a big game changer and, and something that this generation shouldn't take lightly. Like, even our parents, but definitely our parents' parents, you know, had to do a lot to get their hands on knowledge. And so just having a computer, being able to hook up to Wi-Fi and now know so much about, you know, anything that I can Google. So I think that's a huge advent and, Something that definitely changed the scope of, you know, this is my neighborhood. Okay, I, I went on vacation, that's there. But now I can go on a computer and be anywhere in, in minutes. Um, 
I think that's that's very big and probably a big purchase as a middle schooler or high schooler whenever I got a computer. Yeah, I will say, man, uh, I've had a lot of like kind of goofy answers on that one, but that is the most profound so far. So I don't, <laughs> but dude, it's hey, it's, it's, you imagine living without a computer right now and without an iPhone. Yeah, like, exactly. No chance. Um, so what would you thing. answer to that? Mm. Okay. Um, so I've had a lot of people answer with the AirPods, which I would agree with the AirPods. Nice. However, mine, um, I have this small, uh, there's a class of guitar amplifiers that are called tube amps. And they have really awesome sound dynamics, um, but they're usually extremely heavy. And I have this orange brand of amplifiers. Uh, they're literally just called orange amps. Um, and I got this <laughs> little portable tube amp that usually this thing would have to, this can play with a full drum set and it's like a lunchbox. It's that big. Uh, so total game changer for me. Nice. Um, That's a great answer. I would contend that that may be a better answer. Uh, <laughs> I was just kind of rushed. But, uh. No worries, man. Um, so I do want to ask where, uh, you know, to promote yourself. So where can people find you on social media <laughs> and everything? Yeah, Ali Howie at, on LinkedIn. Um, Ali Howie one at Gmail. Ali.Howie at softbank.com. Any of those are good to hit me up on. Um, Ali B. Howie on Twitter. Any of those. Awesome. And... I know we just did it, but I do, uh, I'm now adding, thanks to Tyler Dean's suggestion, uh, every guest can ask me a question at the end. So if you have another question you want to throw out there, uh, this is your opportunity. Yeah, how's uh, Mass Ventures been? Um, and what do you guys think is like the next big technology advancement? It's been amazing. We have massive growth in headcount and programming and, and deal count. You can see everything we were doing on Crunchbase and PitchBook. Um, mm -hmm. a ton. Um, I think that if you look at Ginkgo Bioworks, which is one of our like seriously impactful portfolio companies, um, I mean, I mean, they're all impactful, but Ginkgo has had just had an amazing impact in the world and obviously in Massachusetts specifically. Um, and so I think we are still looking heavily at all deep tech sectors, but being based in Massachusetts and, uh, you know, synthetic biology still being on that, um, mm -hmm. in bio 2.0 way. Um, is something that we're staying close to. Nice. Love it. So Starbucks are me next time we talk, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, well, I'll... You can get yourself Duncan if you want to. Though. Yeah, no, no, no. Look, I get Starbucks every once in a while. I'm not going to lie. So <laughs> um, it's been a pleasure. Um, it's great to catch up. Great to have you on the podcast. And uh, we'll be in touch soon, I'm sure. Yeah, thanks for having me. Talk yeah. to you soon, Snap. Appreciate it. Looking to innovate, invent, and disrupt? We're your partner to fuel your growth. Contact us to learn more.